Sociale e Vitalistici Community di San Carlo Sei. We are honored by the presence of Mr. Kusin Sinan Ulusui, Mr. Jamaletin Aydin from Bekhtas, Turkey. We are honored by the presence of Mr. Tetsu Divani from Turkey, who kindly accepted to give us a taste of the music of the mystical Alevi Bekhtashi music, accompanied by Mr. Merkic, just after the end of his first day of discussions. We are honored by the presence of Mr. Hussein Suleimani from the World Ektashi Center from Albania. We would like to thank all speakers who kindly accepted our invitation. We would like to thank Mr. Evangelos Eretheos, Mr. George Bavromatis and Mrs. Zeynep Turkilimas. Without them, this symposium would have never taken place. This is the first international symposium with such a theme in Greece, and we are very proud that we could hold it at Moha Research Center. Our, Moha, our, our aim as Moha is the promotion and preservation of the cultural and anthropological wealth of Thrace, a region where history, people and traditions made up a unique mosaic. We sincerely hope that the discussions and the knowledge that will emerge during these two days will enrich the Adelie Bektashi studies and will help the public to understand the depth and the richness of the values of Alevis and Bektashism. We do hope that this symposium will be the first of a long series of events and conferences on Bektashism and Alevism here at Moha. And then I will continue in Greek. Θα ήθελα να σα πω ότι θα αρχίσουμε με τι ευχέ που συνηθίζονται από την παραδοσιακό τρόπο τη υποδοχή τη κοινότητα μεταξύ του, για την οποία θα παρακαλέσουμε τον κύριο Λούσουε να μα να, να, να μας κάνει. Κύριε Λούσουε, we kindly ask you to start. Destur-u fil, bir niyet eyledik, geldik bu divana, dağrına durduk, hü dedik cümle canları, hü eyvallah. Hünkar Ali Bektaş Veli, bilimden gidilmeyen yolun sonu karanlıktır demiştir. İnancımızın temeli bilime dayanmaktadır. İnancımızı bilimi aydınlığında ışık ile ifade etmekteyiz. Ο Χατζή Μπεκτάς Βίλι λέει ότι ο δρόμος που δεν ακολουθεί την επιστήμη θα συναντηθεί με το σκοτάδι. Στην πίστη μας ο φως είναι το φως της επιστήμης. Μάρεφετε <Συσχελίου> Allah, ya Muhammed, ya Ali. Hacı Bektaş Veli. Hü, hü, ehli şeriat Hizmetiniz kabul, ışığınız daim olsun. Allah yolla. Hı. 
Hür ehli tarikat erenleri, hizmetiniz kabul, hüsnünüz daim olsun. Allah eyvallah. Hü ehli marifet erenleri, hizmetiniz kabul, ışığınız daim olsun. Allah eyvallah. Hü ehli sırrı hakikat ustazları, hizmetiniz kabul, ışığınız daim olsun. Allah eyvallah. Seyyid el kavne Muhammed Mustafa'nın aşkına, Saki Keser Ali el Mürteza'nın aşkına, Hep Hatice-i Fatma Haydi Musa'nın aşkına, Şah Hasan Hulk-ı Rıza, Şah Hüseyin-i Kerbela, Ol İmam Etkiya, Zeynel Aba'nın aşkına, Allah Allah. Ol Muhammed Bakır Nesli Fakı Mürteza, Cahiri Sadık Rehniman'ın aşkına, Şah İmam Musa Kazım ismi Serfiraz Ehl Hak, O İmam Musa Espiyan'ın aşkına, Şah Taki ve Banaki hem Hasan'ın askeri, O Muhammed Mehdi Sayit Livan'ın aşkına, Firiniz Rüzgarımız Hacı Bektaş'ın aşkına, Haşre'de yanan yaklaşan aşkımız aşkına, Allah'ın eyvallah. Ders durupiyim, ismi şah, Allah Allah. Yedi kat yerde, yedi kat gökte, aşta, kürşte, levdi kalemde, on sekiz bin alemde, kendini her nesneye bahşeder, Adem'e bahşeder, hak aşkına. Hak erenler, çabağa uyanılan cümle erenlerin, hizmetleri kabul, ışıkları daim olan. Allah'a emanet olun. Cabir Hanzer Hüsnü hümmetleri, sefa nazarları üzerimizde olan. Allah Allah. Hak cemi cümlemize birlik, dirlik nasip eylesin. Allah Allah. Hacı
Teşekkürler. Και τώρα ο πρόεδρο τη κοινότητα Αλεκτρικών Πεκτασίδων Ζάκη, κύριο Αχμέτ Καραποζή. Ευχαριστώ. Καλησπέρα σα. Από τον το Χουρασάν στην Ανατολή και από την Ανατολή στα Βαλκάνια τώρα. Είναι το θέμα, το συμπόδιο σήμερα που διοργανώνεται εδώ στη, στο Ιμαρέτ της πανέμορφης Καβάλας, η πόλη που σκόμαστε. Καλώς ήρθατε όλοι όσοι ήρθαν από το εξω, εξωτερικό, το συμπόδιο αυτό. Ευχαριστώ και την κυρία Άννα Μησεριάν που μας προοξενεί σήμερα εδώ. Der Rimsafiller, Jörg de Schindan, der Jörg de Schindan, der Jörg de Schindan, der Jörg de Schindan, der Jörg de Schindan, der Jörg de Schindan, der Jörg de Schindan, der Jörg de Schindan, der Jörg de Schindan, der Jörg de Yunanistan ülkemizde ilk defa gerçekleştirilmektedir. Bunu da düzenleyen Sayın Ana Miseryan gördüğümüz tanıdık konu hepimiz. Kendisine çok teşekkür ediyorum. Böyle bir organizasyon için. Evet. Koca ağrımıza da kolaylık diliyorum bundan sonra. Sağ olun, var olun. Thank you very much, all of you. Now we will start with the uh, introduction. So we have two distinguished scholars with us, uh, Mr. Kostadinos Sisenikis and uh, Mrs. Angel Gizyaka. Uh, I give the floor to Mrs. Gizyaka. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Asiatic communities, not only from Greece, but also from Albania and Turkey and North Macedonia, probably. Yes, yes, yes, yes, yes, yes. Probably. And also my colleague, Yorgos Mavromatis, who is a pioneer, a pioneer on Baked Asiatic studies during many years, and he is next to the communities. And of course, uh, Evangelos Areteos, who were together in the path to know Baked Asiatic in Albania, uh, recently, and from where a friend is coming and is a member of the World Central Bektashi uh, Center, uh, he sends to Suleiman. So I'm very glad to be here today. I have prepared, let's say, a very scientific paper, which I will not be seeing you all in here. But I will try to tell you what I know about Sufism and Bektashism, not mainly Bektashism, but mainly about Sufism, since my field of studies is on religion. I am a theologian. I finished the School of Theology here at Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. And after I made long studies on Islam in France, I had the opportunity to live in Jordan, in Syria, the good days in Damascus. And the last, let's say, more than 25 years of my life, I'm going very recently coming and going back to the Middle East, but also in the Balkans, by trying to know the Muslim communities and at the same time to see that these communities are not stable. That to see and to understand the changing realities and to find what unites us and also to know what divides us. And since I am a theologian and I am studying explicitly Islam, uh, my research focused in the beginning and I, was, I will just tell you a few words about this for this uh, conference just to understand how Western uh, scientific works have understood uh, Sufi in general. So, we know that from the late 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, and let's say until the end of the 19th century, or even beginning of the 20th century, the colonial powers, that went through the world, that is today Middle East, India, and also our era, area, they try to understand Sufi also <coughs> the day that the world of Sufism, of Islamic mysticism, by seeing <coughs> mainly the Persian experience, since the majority of them they were Persian speakers. And so from this time arrives a lot of, uh, let's say, statues of well-known <coughs> travelers and at the same time colonels, but also uh, theologians that they have tried to understand Sufism in the eyes mainly of Persian experience and by trying to understand Islam but with a way that does not satisfy today, satisfy today the Muslim scholars. So there is a big uh, discussion about what is Sufism and how what the uh, Western scholars have seen and have understood about Sufism. Later, in the beginning of the 20th century, more precise works have been done by Western scholarship about Sufism. And these are the works of Reynold Nicholson, Vensing, Nyberg, Lamens, Margaret Smith, Laura Andre, and Tassin Palacios. And these people, they, they went deeper, they found the manuscripts, they found the poetry and they try to understand how within 
Islamic mysticism exists, which is the vocabulary of Islamic mysticism, and which are, let's say, the similarities with Christianity, the Hellenistic world, and mainly the Neoplatonic milieu, where the first, let's say, all the religions of the first millennium, and also Islam, were incorporated and also at the same time have created their own identity. Okay. One of these pioneers was Vignon. He was a French uh, priest and he dedicated his all uh, his life to, to the conversation of Christianity with Islam. And also he gave us the essay Sugar's Origin, his main book on Al Halaj, father. Um, and he gave us an essay on the origins of the technical language of Islamic mysticism. After him, another scholar, Arbery, who saw in Sufism an expression of the universal mysticism. Um, went further, and today we have a lot of new people that all the new, after the, the, the let's say, after the middle of the 20th century and throughout our days, that, that, they, that they are in the field of uh, Sufism, and they try to understand what Sufism is in its diversity. What is very interesting that is that within Sufism, we have the big, very big teachers. One of them that we know very well here in Greece, of course, is Haji Bertas Veli and the Bertas community, but also other big Sufi teachers, or Babas, or Sayyid, like Maulana Jalalitin Rumi. And uh, they used to be also the Mevlevi order in the region, and but not only here, but also in Thessaloniki. Other tariqas, and tariqas also more related to the Sunni and late Ottoman Empire, like the Rexpandi and the Harbeti and other. But today, very few of these communities are, are alive and at the same time are connected with the rest of the Muslim community, that in their majority there, there are Sunnis. This community for Greece, but also for the other Balkan countries, is mainly the Bektashi Alevi community, or Bektashi alone. And you will tell us about the double use of the word. And of course, in Kosovo, we have also the Rifai communities, they're still strong, and they still implement their practices. And because Ms. Teratheos tells me that I am already at the end of my speech, three minutes, I will dedicate these three minutes to the poetry. I think it's the best thing. thing. We learn, even from our schools, in the lesson of religion, when we refer to Islam, even when I was young, and this is very good, we learn the words of Rabbi al the first let's say, lady, that she was a mystic at that time. And she was a man, that she said, Oh my Lord, the stars shine and people's eyes are closed. The kings have closed the doors. And each lover is alone with her love. And I am here alone with you. And this is the love, the expression of love towards God. And, of course, with Maulana Jalemidu Norumi, that he is looking for the friend, he is looking for his friend, he is looking for God, he is looking for Allah. And when he is starting to understand that Allah is inside him, he does not differentiate between I and you. Tarikas still in our world. And they are spread, spread through the whole humanity. But also in the Middle East, also in the Indian continent and Pakistan, 
There are many and different tarikas also in Africa and of course in Western countries and uh, the United States. All of them, they want to experience God and they have different practices. At the same time, the core of the Muslim, let's say, faith is within these tarikas, that is without faith, that God is one. But the veneration and the practices can divert, differ, and also women presentation within the tarikas can be shared. There are tarikas that are very friendly toward women, there is no any discrimination, and other tarikas that are explicitly for men. But we will learn, thanks to this symposium, about the lectureships, and I am very glad that you are here to listen from me, and I think this will be the path for the future. When the scientists they will start working with the communities, and they will try to understand the experience of the community, and to give it also to, to the, let's say, to the academic uh, communities and to be a mutual understanding and a mutual research. By learning from the other, both sides learn. And the learning, as you said at the beginning, is our duty toward God and towards humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear Angeliki. Indeed, uh, Islamic mysticism, Sufism, is uh, one of the most fascinating spiritual phenomena uh, in, uh, in the world. And uh, all this uh, very insightful uh, trip through the ages that Angeliki gave us uh, brings us to uh, the, uh, the Bektashi, uh, and other traditions, which we will explore later today, and brings us also to Greece and in uh, and Islam in Greece. And I will give the floor to uh, Kostadinos, who will tell us about all that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Vangeli. Uh, it's really an important uh, day today. I think it's the first time in history that we have a an open public discussion about uh, Bektashism and uh, Alevism in Greece with the community, from the community and the scholars from the universities, from different countries also. I think it's a very important to have all these combination, combined elements in this discussion. So I'm uh, very glad to be here with you, in this panel, the first panel. Of course, we are going to learn from you more than you are going to learn from us. And I want to thank you, to thank Anna, Ms. Iliana, Ms. Anna, Ms. Iliana and the Moha uh, Foundation for this excellent idea. Evangelos and the Gorgos. Uh, I'm sorry, NJNEP. NJNEP, sorry. NJNEP. Uh, who have uh, worked to make uh, this true. So I will go through uh, things that you may know, but I'm going to do this as an introduction about uh, the presence of Islam in Greece as a modern state. So from the Ottoman Empire to the modern Greek state. So it's very difficult, it's very difficult to have a precise knowledge about uh, heterodox uh, Islam or Tariqat. When we're dealing with Islam in this period of time, 19th century. So if you go back to history, I'm not a historian, but from the knowledge we know and I have shared with my colleagues, we know that the presence in the southern Balkans of all these tariqat, we are talking about the Bektashi communities and also the Vlaviru, Fahil, Halbeti, mostly, in the southern Balkans. There are some young, very important uh, period of time, how they came here, how they arrived, how people converted to them, but I'm not going to, to talk a lot about this. And uh, the important dates here are the, the expansion of the Greek territory. So 1881, 1913, 1923, 
So on the expansion of the Greek territory, so the change of the territory makes the Ottoman Empire less territory and the Greek state bigger. So once it was bigger, immediately we have new citizens. And these new citizens were more and more Muslims as a percentage. So together with the Sunni, we have a lot of tariqat. But we don't know a lot, this is important to know, because the sources and the material we know are not talking about them, but the Greek state and the Greek sources talk about Muslims. But even the Greeks don't know exactly what are these Muslims. And this is one important element. So, how, what, was the, what was the position of the Muslims in Greece as Greek citizens? The important element there, and this is not only applicable to Greece, but to other Christian states in the Balkans, like Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Romania, is that they have used the legal the legacy of the Ottoman Milet in a reverse situation where they, they preserved the community structures like the protection of the personal status, so the Sharia law as far as a family and inheritance law is concerned. The Mufti becomes Kadi in this important non-Balkan states. We have community schools, as they were before, and we have the Vakuf, the foundations, so community properties. In each of these dates, so 1881, 1913, 1923, we have a legal framework. So we have a protection as a minority. So the millet is transformed into a minority. And as you know, by the end of the First World War, we have the League of Nations that establishes and elaborates a uniform more or less minority protection all over Europe and even in Iraq is the only exception outside Europe. So we have a, this for the first time the use of the term minority protection. And in this context we have the minority protection of the Muslims in Greece. Here we have a paradox. When we are talking about minority protection, at the same time in the end of the Greek Turkish war we have the elimination of the minorities in both Greece and Turkey through the notorious population exchange, which was mandatory. So they didn't ask people if you want to go to your king state, go, but you have to go. And this was very important. With one exception, as we know very well, Thrace, Thrakia, and the Muslims of Epirus, the Albanian speaking Muslims in Greece. Here, in this map, you can see where you have these small numbers. The small numbers represent the communities, the Muslim communities. Of course, you know where it is, so we have the communities there. And the rest of Greece, they have been eliminated through the population exchange. And the Dodecanese Islands, Rhodos and Kos, are two communities that they were as a new territorial annexation after 1947. So where we can locate here Bektashi or other communities before the population exchange? As far as we know from the sources, of course we know Thrace, which is still alive, but they were much more extended in Komodini and maybe in Xanthi in other villages. Thessaloniki we know there were more than 15 uh, tekes, and we have a representation of, of all tarikat, like Medlevi, uh, even Murufai, Bektashi, and Halbeti, in the Saloniki. We have in other, in other cities like Ceres, Rama, we know, and in Epirus. And last, in Crete, in Crete we have a lot. 
in Thessalonia, who have in the border here with Macedonia, in Tempe, and Irene, in Farsala, and in Katerini, in Macedonia, in Macedonia also. In Konica, in Epirus, in Yamina, we're going to see some examples. So after the population exchange, there is no one left but in Thrace, in Epirus for 30 years only, and in Irene and Katerini. So there are the small communities left, or because there were Muslims of Thrace, or because there were Albanian-speaking Muslims. <coughs> so, through my research, and, and the key element here is the transition. So we have different transitions from the dominant millet during the Ottoman period to the minority protection in the modern state, the Greek state. So we have the transition from a multi-ethnic empire to a nation state is absolutely different. The configuration, the position through citizenship, and this is very important again to understand that what was important before was the loyalty to the Sultan. Here we have the link as a citizen to the state. And then eventually the protection of someone because of the religion, which is Islam. So here we have invisibility of the tariqat. And another very radical transition for those who have been eradicated because of the population exchange. So we don't have at all presence on territory. So because of the population exchange. So all communities, Sunni and different tariqat, are not anymore existing. So what they faced within 10 or 20 years was so radical for their lives of the communities from 1913 to 1920 to 2024. So what we're, go we're going to look about, to talk about special rights as a minority protection, we have to have in mind that we have collective rights as a community, so always an elect system is there, of course not as it was in the Ottoman Empire, but we have kind of neo electism as a legal framework. But where the tariqat are visible in, in this framework? Throughout my research, and the colleagues we know and we share our information, is that we have very little information about this. Especially when we are talking about the pre-population exchange period of time. So the, these 10 years, 1913-1923. And I can just read to you some small elements. There's no theory behind this because it's very difficult. But just to see how there's a presence through the archives of this tarikat. So, in 1922, when we say to Fendi, the former city of the Lake Sistan, Lake Sistan, so today is in Neapoli in Kozani, was started as a teacher by the community school in a village. It was described by the Greek agent there is a fanatic Muslim acting against anything Greek or Bektashi. Meaning that there was a confrontation between the Greeks and Bektashi from one side and the others the other side. We are talking about 1922. <laughs> you may imagine something today, but this is a, the, the political issue of this. Just as regards the presence, in 1922, sorry, 1920, the Muslim community of Hanya, you know, a city in Crete, was granted by the state a loan to repair a teke. So the teke was alive. There was a community. In 1922, a year before the population changed, the Baba of the teke Juma of Thessaloniki 
transferred the Vakuf of the Tekel to the Muslim community of Thessaloniki. And he was granted a salary as a livelihood. So we see here a transaction. So the Sunni community, which is recognized by the state, absorbs a small Bektashi community of Thessaloniki, one of these. A contrary case, again in Thessaloniki, in 19, 1919, the Seikha Sfer, head of the Mevlevite Key of Thessaloniki, appeared against the decision taken by the Mufti of Thessaloniki for placing the management of the Teke under the Mufti's direct control. So here we see that the Mufti of Thessaloniki, the Sunni Mufti of Thessaloniki, tries to control directly the Mevlevite Key of Thessaloniki. Um, so there are other, other uh, about some data about phrase that there were two tekes. Uh, the army was taking the tekes in Germany for the usage for the, to, to accommodate the refugees. But there is a, there is a report that in Groverio there were 21 C. So it was a very important together. Maybe from all over the region, why do we don't know? How the way they report. We know there was a teke in the drama. Uh, we know from other reports there was a, a, an operating teke in Manina. Sorry, three tekes in Manina. And then of course we know that there was the Bektashi teke of Irene in Farsala which survived the population change because it was Albanian. The division was survived until the early 1970s. And then we have a very interesting story, but I don't have the time, I have only three minutes, to explain what happened with this very important monument. But very interestingly, the community vanished from then, but then we have a new community through the Albanian immigrants that they revived the use of this so, here we have it. this triangle that to have a Greek state, Greek institutions, they have the Muslim as a, one minority, and then we have the, the Tarikat as a minority, the minority, the minority which are invisible to the eyes institutionalized of the state. Okay. This I would be time to explain the three religions in Europe would, would like to place our discussion what happens in this post-Ottoman region but of course when we are talking about Greece I'm pretty sure that it's valid for Bulgaria the states, the Christian states like uh, Serbia, Montenegro and others and North Macedonia but when talking about Islam the Tarikat we have to see the picture about Eastern, Eastern Europe and Western Europe. And the main conclusion here that is that we have faced asymmetric schemes of legal and political uh, contact between the Greek state, the Sunni community as a majority, and the small communities of the different tarikat. The Bakuf was the only one that institution that can match with a small entity. So one that could be one Bakuf, one that could be a so is the only institution that can be used in favor of the community. And I would like just to finish here we have a political and ideological antagonism between the community of citizens, and of course all are citizens of the state, we have the community of the nation, so which nation do you belong to the Greek, Turkish, or whatever, sometimes, and the community within Islam. So we have three different levels of uh, antagonism and coexistence. And I think uh, here I'm finishing, and I thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Kostadina and Mauricio. Thank you very much, Kostadina, for this very, very interesting and uh, insightful expose, despite the time limit. Uh, now I would like to give the floor to. Uh... Ah. ah, yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, so, uh... Do you have any questions, any comments you would like to say before we go to the next panel? Αν έχει κάποιος κάποια ερώτηση θέλει να πει κάτι σχετικά με αυτά που ακούσαμε, μπορεί να στήσει το μικρόφωνο. Especially of religious character, not the houses. And what happened with the Albanian Albania, take care of Farsalan, which is the most important, or with the, the take care of uh, Katerini, which was belonged, belonged under the name of uh, the family of uh, Hassan Bektas. So there was no law about this. Story. So it's very complicated what happened then. Still, I don't know if you are familiar with uh, uh, Torbali Sultan Teke in Iran. So maybe we'll have the time to talk later. Yes. It's a, a very big and bigger political story. Uh, this is very interesting. Thank you very much. There are many questions related to your question. How, how for example, the the Alkuf that belongs to this communities, uh, how they have been assumed also by the Sunni majority, but at the same time, why some of these uh, tariqas, they have been completely lost. For example, we know that until the 60s, 
there were healthy families, also in means of uh, Middle East, even in Thessaloniki, some of them they were in Thrakia, and some, some of them they were even south of But after that, they have been completely lost. So we have to look also to the policies. And uh, what is very difficult today, and what also uh, Mr. Tsitsiliki said, Dr. Tsitsiliki, is that we don't have a lot of documentation for many different reasons. And we, we know, for example, that in this region of Croatia, they used to exist a lot of PKs. Today, only one PK remains, the PK of Russia. But we cannot identify to whom this PK has belonged. In the first writings, like the Zaginis writing, uh, the majority of the decades for him were belonging to the Bektashi community. But this is without documentation. So I don't know today how much we can learn. We would have to look also to the Ottoman archives and other archives, but still a lot to discover from the old days and for today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any more questions? Kamiari Rossi? Στα ελληνικά θα την κάνω την ερώτηση. Γιατί πιστεύετε ότι οι μοφτίδες δεν ασχολήθηκαν με τις περιουσίες των αλληβητών. Είμαστε μια θρησκευτική κοινότητα αλληβητών. Ε, από ό,τι είπατε κι εσείς, υπάρχουν πολυτεκέδες, γενικά στη Θράκη, αλλά όχι μόνο στη Θράκη και στην Ελλάδα. Και οι τρεις μοφτίδες που σήμερα γνωρίζουμε, της Ξάνθης, της Κομωτινής και των Ομό Εύρω, δεν ασχολήθηκαν καθόλου με τις περιουσίες των αλευτών. Εκτός Θράκης λέτε. Εντός Θράκης. Εντός, εντός ε, Θράκης. Γιατί δεν ασχολήθηκαν και οι περιουσίες που πήγαν στο κράτος, αν μπορούμε κάποια στιγμή να, τα, να διεκδικήσουμε τα δικαιώματά μας και να πάρουμε αυτές τις περιουσίες πίσω. Και επίσης, οι... ο ΤΕΚΕΣ δεν είναι ένας, είναι δύο στον Εύρο, είναι τη Ρούσας και το Μικροδέριο. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Το πρόβλημα των, των βακουφικών περιουσιών, όπως και είναι πολύ περίπλοκο και πολύ δύσκολο με την έννοια ότι αν συγκρίνουμε το πόσες ήταν οι περιουσίες το 1930 ή το 50 με το πόσες ήταν το 2020, Ξέρετε πολύ καλύτερα από μένα ότι έχουν μείνει α πούμε μισέ. Έτσι, και το πω χοντρικά. Επειδή μου έκανε μεγάλη εντύπωση και μου φάγε περίπου 10 χρόνια, 10 χρόνια κυριολεκτικά, να κάνω απλώ τη λίστα ποια είναι τα βακούφια στη Θράκη, δηλαδή δεν περίμενα ποτέ θα είχα τόσο τεράστια δυσκολία να μπορέσω να μαζέψω μια λίστα με. Δεν θυμάμαι πόσα είναι, 95 βακούφια. Όχι τι ανήκει στο κάθε βακούφια. Αλλά τα βακούφια, όπω ξέρετε, το κάθε βακούφι είναι ένα ίδρυμα από μόνο του. Υπήρχε τέτοια αδιαφάνεια. Εδώ, σκεφτείτε λίγο να αφήσει κάτι λάσκαρα στο δημόσιο, τι γίνεται. Τέτοια αδιαφάνεια εσωτερικά και στι κοινότητε και σε όλο αυτό το πολιτικό πρόβλημα που έγινε με τι βακουφικέ επιτροπέ που δεν εκλέγονται από το 1964. Πρέπει να το πούμε αυτό και με την ιστορία και τις περιπέτειες των μυφτίδων, που ξέρουμε, για παράδειγμα, ότι στην Ξάνθη ε, κατα... πουλήθηκαν πάρα πολύ εύκολα τα ακουφικά κτήματα στη δεκαετία του 70 και χάθηκαν πάρα πολλά τα ακουφικά. Τώρα, δεν ξέρω αν ειδικά για τα λεβίτικα μακούφια της ΤΕΝ, αυτά που ανήκουν στους δύο ή τρεις δεκέδες ή τους παλιούς, γιατί Άλλο ερώτημα είναι τι γίνεται με αυτού του τεκέδε που είναι ορφανοί πλέον, χωρί κοινότητα, 
στο σέλερο πώς πώς ή στην ψάθη. Αυτό είναι ένα άλλο πολύ ενδιαφέρον ερώτημα. Απορροφήθηκαν προφανώς και δεν ξέρω αν έχουν γραμμένα ακίνητα στο όνομά τους. Αλλιώ ανήκουν στην αρχαιολογική υπηρεσία πλέον ω προ τη διατήρηση των. Άρα θέλει πολλή έρευνα. Εγώ έφτασα την έρευνα όσο εκεί μπορούσα. <Κι> Ξέρω ότι έγιναν πάρα πολλά πράγματα περίεργα. Ε, θέλει όμω και μια κινητοποίηση των κοινοποιητών να διεκδικήσουν όπω είπατε στο τέλο. Όπω αντιδικούσατε ένα χαμένο χωράκι του σα. Ε, αν υπάρχουν τίτλοι. Έτσι, είναι τα γνωστά νομικά ζητήματα για να μπορέσετε να διεκδικήσετε. Τα κίνητα που ανήκουν σε ένα λεπτικό βαπτιστικό πνεύμα. Και για την αδιαφορία, λίγο αν μπορείτε. Η αδιαφορία μπορεί να είναι καθαρά πολιτικού χαρακτήρα μέχρι καθαρά προσωπικού για να. Το κάθε το εκάστοτε μου φταίει. Τι λε, ναι. Ξέρουμε για παράδειγμα ότι την δεκαετία του 1970 φαγώθηκαν πολλά χρήματα και φύγανε αλλού. Έχει κάποιο άλλο ένα πολιτικό, μπορεί να είναι συνδυασμό. Είναι πάρα πολλά προβλήματα, ειδικά εκεί όπου έχουμε, όπου έχουμε χρήματα. Έτσι. Είναι ένα γενικό φαινόμενο. και φροντίζει για το πώ θα αναστηριχθεί, τι θα γίνει, να μην καταστραφεί, να μην πολιτεί, να μην πολιτεί, να μην Αλλά δεν αποκλείται την ίδια στιγμή να ανήκει σε μια κοινότητα. Ωραία, σα ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ. Μπορούμε. Δεν είναι βέβαιο συνόδο. Πάντω νομίζω, κύριε Πυρελή, ότι τα τελευταία χρόνια υπάρχουν καλύτερε επικοινωνίε και με τις κοινότητες και με τους μυστήρες. Δεν υπάρχουν τόσο μεγάλοι ανταγωνισμοί όσο υπήρχαν παλιότερα. Εσείς το ξέρετε καλύτερα από μένα, βέβαια. Αλλά ότι ακριβώς προς αυτή την κατεύθυνση χρειάζεται επικοινωνία. Και αυτό είναι που, που το χρειαζόμαστε όλοι. Τη δια, διαρκή επικοινωνία και πολλές φορές αδιαμεσολάβητη επικοινωνία. Αυτή είναι πάντοτε προς όφελος των κοινοτήτων μέσα στην, στην ποικιλία του. Σα ευχαριστώ πολύ. Ωραία. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ. Τώρα θα περάσουμε στο πρώτο πάνελ του συμποσίου. Θα καλέσω τον ε, Γιώργο του Παπαδόπουλου. Θα πάμε στο δεύτερο πάνελ του συμποσίου. Θα ήθελα να πω στον Γιώργο του Παπαδόπουλου και τον Ζεϊνέπου Αϊδάν. Και θα έχουμε και τον Μίστερ Ιζάγιλ Τιρίμ και τον Μίστερ Χιθλόρι από το Zoom. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Thank you very much. Λίγο περίεργο αυτό το συνέδριο. Είναι πολύ ενδιαφέρον γιατί συμμετέχουν και επιστήμονε και οι άνθρωποι από την κοινότητα. Έτσι ψάχνουμε να βρούμε μια ενδιάμεση γλώσσα έτσι όλοι να καταλαβαίνουν όλου. Έτσι λοιπόν ψάχνουμε να βρούμε μια ενδιάμεση γλώσσα να πούμε που όλοι να καταλαβαίνουν όλου και προσπαθούμε. Ε, είναι σίγουρο ότι κάποια πράγματα από αυτά οι άνθρωποι από τι κοινότητε τα ακούν για πρώτη φορά. Κάποιοι άλλοι είναι πιο εξοικειωμένοι. Ό,τι σας έρχεται στο μυαλό, οτιδήποτε, ρωτήστε το παρακαλώ, βοηθάει τη συζήτηση στο να προχωρήσει. Ή βοηθάει να πάμε τα πράγματα παραπέρα όλοι. Ε, οπότε, ό,τι σας έρχεται στο μυαλό, ρωτήστε το, μην διστάζετε δηλαδή, αυτό ήθελα να σας πω. Ε, προχωράμε λοιπόν στο δεύτερο, μάλλον στο πρώτο πάντελ, γιατί αυτό ήταν μια εισαγωγή. Ε, so, we move on to our first panel, because uh, till this time it was our introduction to our symposium. The title of the panel is 
historical and religious origin of the Alpism Bethesis. Um, many people, especially the people in the community, uh, know their history. But the history of the community is the history of the community. We have the history of the whole perception of the tarikat, which is known actually only by the scholars. Every community knows a limited uh, approach of the history, and it's, uh, there are communities who do not communicate among them. People from Bulgaria, I don't think that they communicate with people in Albania and the people in uh, Abdal Rusatik down there. But all of the people belong in the same narrative, in the same discussion regarding television and democracy. So, we are happy here to have uh, Rizal Yudirin, who unfortunately was not able to come here, and we are trying to connect. Are we connected? No. Yes, please, if it's possible. Uh, it's Mr. Heath Lorry. Yes. Okay, so let's start, let's follow our, uh, the line of the program. Let's start with Riza Yildirim, who is going to present us, um, to have a presentation, the formation of the Bektasi spiritual genealogy, which is named Silsila in the Tarikat um, system. A revisionist look at the formative period of the Bektasi history. Uh, there is a little bit of the Hello? Can you uh, see me and hear me? Yes, you can see and hear you, but just a minute, we, will not, we need to standardize something. Okay? Because okay. I don't see you. Okay. You because don't see us, yes, because the camera is on our computer and you just hear us, yes? Well, uh, I see something that made this broadcast on YouTube. I don't see anything on YouTube channel. Sure, sure. Okay. Just a But are you going to uh, show me myself or are you going to show the audience? Okay. Can you me I can see you. We can see you. You are projected in the uh, screen. I don't so see you. All the people can watch. I don't hear you now. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, if you say anything, I don't, I don't hear you. Do you hear us? Do you hear me? Yeah, I hear you now. Okay, great. So, yes, please go. Well, I was I was saying here, uh, how can I go to the audience instead of myself? It's impossible because it's a kind of the setting of the cameras, so they can see you, but you cannot see them. All right, all right, that's fine. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for the invitation on this great panel. Uh, I was listening to the presenters for the first uh, session. They are really interesting to hear. All the structure in Turkey is known to the countries are structures are very similar, and especially in the of world, how they define. Even though the East Coast states were formed as a nation state, this created as a nation state, they formed, they define people, 
still, according to the religious basis, that should still be interesting and fascinating. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm going to talk about the earlier period today, uh, which might be a little bit specific to uh, those who are not specialized in the question of the If it happens so, I'm sorry, you know, for this. Uh, I will try to do my best not to warn you, but I cannot do this because it's kind of specific. And our chair, Mr. Chair, said that uh, history, back to back classes, history, history of back classes, if you know, that is only known by scholars and uh, uh, people in the largest scale do not know this history. Uh, the second part of the statement is obviously I agree, but I, I disagree with the first part even because I don't think that we know it's not the best that guys should be doing well. So at least I can say there are some fundamental, basic fundamental questions about this history which can still bring to the answer. Uh, I will address one of those questions today. I, I don't have such kind of answer, to be honest. But at least I have a question. And that question has not been even uh, asked to uh, enough, I can say enough, in this part version. So in, in a broader scale, I will talk about the foundation of the Bekdash Sufi order. That is Sufi order, which means the transformation of the mystic or cultic tradition around the name of Antibekta's Reli into an institutionalized Sufi order during the late 15th and early 16th century. So my major question today has been in my research and now today still is how this transformation happened. So what, what is a Sufi order? And what is a, a, the process of founding a Sufi order? Let's start with this basic question. So in the literature, since the beginning of uh, the century, the 20th century, uh, since the inception of the scholarly studies on Bekdash of history and religious tradition, there is this uh, shabuun accepted by almost everyone that Bekdashism has started as an occultic mystic movement uh, around the name of Adhiti Bekdash, whether Adhiti Bekdash really himself was an influential person or not during his time. But after his time, we know that uh, among the various circles in Balkan Territoria, his name became so popular and then that appeared like a cult around his name. But that was a, a mystical tradition which cannot be called a Sufi order. Later on, towards the end of the 15th century, that Sufi tradition turned into a, a Sufi order, uh, a process which had by Balancing. So that is known in this scholarship so far. And everybody, almost everyone, except this Shablon, I personally also subscribe to this framework, but that's all. We don't know much about this process. So how did this happen? First of all, who was Balun Sultan? What do we know about the Balun Sultan? He, he is very important in this history, obviously. He is accepted as the second founder. He is Sari in the Bekdash tradition, which is quite correct, right? because the major proof for this is if you look at the complex of the Bekdash complex in uh, town today, you see the, the, the biggest home, of course, the most of the Bekdash really himself, the founder, the longest founder of the order, and then the second one after him belongs to Balun Sultan. That alone shows how important Balun Sultan is in this Sufi tradition. But who was Balun Sultan? We know, we know so little about this person. Actually, we know so little about Bekdashi history at all. And I believe the major reason, the major reason for this is the destruction of Bekdashi sources behind the 
uh, a closure of back the uh, genocide court under the clash of social order in 1926. So we should have much more, many more sources about that clash. Because that clash of social order was very much integrated in the Ottoman system. So I would say, I would be able to say that that clash of social order was actually a kind of semi-official institution in the Ottoman regime. So it, it was so Ottoman. And there, there must have been a lot of sources produced by Bekrashi themselves and other people around about Bekrashi, but we, we don't have the, those sources now. That's why the whole history is in the dark, in most part. And most of all, this foundation period. So, again, the major question, what should we understand from the concept of foundation of a Sufi order? What happened during this period? For Balu Sultan, I found uh, an archival document which, uh, which really proved that that person actually believed that it was important, and I published this in my book, Bektash in Indosia, so I don't, uh, I don't like going into the details of that, Balu Sultan. But uh, let me uh, just recapture the major questions. So when we talk about the Sufi order, we are talking about an institution. That's very important to understand. We are talking about an institution. And what are the major primary uh, principles, offices, personalities, um, ideas that hold this institution? There are several, but one of the most important among them is a genealogy, uh, a spiritual genealogy. <coughs> If you are talking at an institutionalized Sufi order, you have to you have to have a Sufi genealogy because the whole theory of now Sufi now is based on this concept of genealogy. They believe in that there is a hidden knowledge which is much more related to the heart than brain, and that knowledge can be attained only to attaching yourself to a person. Who has this knowledge? And that creates a lineage from master to disciple, master to disciple. You have to have this in your way. And this is called Shushila in Sufi order. Whatever Sufi order you put, if it's an institutionalized Sufi order, you will have a Shushila, which goes back to the Prophet Muhammad. So we have and Sufi Sushra for bad fashions as well. But in the literature, that has not been even attracted attention. So we didn't, we didn't even give that pay attention whether those people have a Sushra or not. And if they have, what is the Sushra? How did they appear? Because these Sushra are mostly construction. They are reflected backwards when the Sufi order is established. And it was the case in Spectacle Sufi order as well. That's why it's so prominent. So I have been struggling with developing and reconstructing uh, uh, a Sufi as geneal Sufi genealogy, a uh, Silsila Spectacle Sufi order. And I, I, I cannot reach any conclusion yet because there are different. Uh, Claims which compete and conflict each other. Now that's normal because you need Silsila whenever you create uh, establish a Sufi order. In the Bektashi case, when the cultic tradition around the Bektashi Valley uh, turned into a Sufi order during the late 15th and 16th century, the first thing they did was to create a Sufi genealogy for this. Uh, so, uh, this order. And there are some brilliant aspects of Bektashi Sufi order. As a starter, this is a Sufi order. It's not just like other Sufi orders. But this Sufi order has some unique aspects which we don't see in other Sufi orders. What are those unique aspects? One is Bektashi Sufi order is probably in the old Islamic world, Islamic world. Probably it is the one 
which is considered or which harbor more hazardous, as it's called, which is a problem in turn in other years and vectorship studies, but I will use it. Hazardous elements. So that's one aspect. Backlashes should be ordered, harbors more, much more heterodox elements when you compare with the other ship like cardinal, automatic, yeah, yeah. naturally especially. But they also have some so-called heterodox elements, backlashes are, backlashes have more, much more. More a unique, another unique as aspect, and which uh, is, I believe, really uh, we see in Bangladesh Sufi order. I, I don't recall any other Sufi order which has the same structure. And that is dual lineage within the Sufi order. That dual structure from the very early period, at the, by the inception of Sufi order itself, during the time of Bani Sultan, Bangladesh Sufi order was established on two parallel lineages. That's very interesting. On the one hand, you have the Chalim family. This is a family that uh, claims to be the descendants of Haji Bekdash himself. And they have a lineage. <laughs> that lineage has both uh, biological and spiritual qualities, attributes. And there's another lineage, which is the Devadah <coughs> Sisi. After Bali Sultan, there's a parallel since the Bekdash order. Uh, which belongs to Deda Bonus. And within the order itself, we see the two structure, which is very, very interesting. But the main silsila of the Bekdashi uh, Sufi order has been accepted by the Ottoman authorities and all the world was the silsila of Chelem family. It was not the Deda Bonus So that's why I am going to focus on that Today. If you look at our sources, so what, what sources do we have for uh, the foundation period of Bekdash Sufi order and especially for Bekdash system? First, we have official genealogy, uh, Sufi, uh, spiritual and also biological genealogy, which are recorded in the official Jazzet Talmud spiritual diplomas, a diploma of authority given to people, other people, shades, to be uh, uh, by the Bektashi authorities, especially in the South of the Bektashi. So we have a bunch of those Ijazat elements. Uh, interestingly, again, that's, that's a very official document, official to the Sufi order. And I believe there was a, a kind of office in the complex there, and they were producing those documents according to certain, certain formal structures. But unfortunately, we don't have documents preserved in the order complex itself. Because again, their sources are just distracted. But we have, luckily, individual documents preserved by Ahalavi Dadas, who were given those documents by the Bektashi Center, especially during the 18th century. That's important because this had been the public from the period before the shutdown of the Bektashi Sufi order. So that period is another period in the Bektashi history. It, and they have to be very careful by you, if you, when you use sources from that period. So, first thing is that we have those official ones. And then we have Babai, uh, Babayan sources. In the 19th century, Bangladeshis who were athletes to Babayan branch, at the Baba branch, because that Chalabi family was just expanded and banned from Sufi activities. So the Babayans and the Babas and Babas became the major figures in the Bangladesh world. And they, they, uh, they had some intellectuals, and those, some of those intellectuals uh, uh, wrote books in the 19th century and early 20th century. And in those books, we see another 
this course about the foundation tree of the Bethlehem theory, and of course we see another version of the system. And then we have a third group. Uh, actually, that's the one book, Jeremiah uh, Pichelovic's book with Alpha. This person uh, was competing with the Babagantu during the early 20th century and they were trying to get back to the community of the Chay family. And within this family, he has written that book, and in that book we see another world of the system. And most importantly, and this happened after. I published this, the book that I should go through. I found another document in the archive which is dated 1488. This document is authorizing Sufi Akhi in the position of uh, Mahmoud Chalabi. Uh, I'm going to talk about this person as a very important pivotal person in the foundation of the project. Uh, and there we see another version of Sufi so by the system, by the way, I have to say that after uh, the, this Mahmoud Chalabi downward towards the end of the, the other end of the, the, the Sufi border, this is less standard. You see the name, the same name everywhere. The problem begins during the form of the period, begins by this Mahmoud Chalabi. So that the earlier version is different from all of these four groups of sources. Why this is happening? That, that's normal because everybody, everything has a, a you know, claim of legitimacy and they're trying to base uh, legitimacy on their own understanding of the Bekashi history and they have their own understanding of or, or genealogy. Historically, though, the earliest person I have I could uh, establish in the Bengali history, and um, which has a place in this genealogy, is Mahmoud Chalabi, and also by who is a contemporary of Balusi. Actually, I have already published in the book and claimed that Balusi and Mahmoud Chalabi were very close to each other. Actually, I believe that Mahmoud Chalabi was. Uh, uh, Balutan married a, uh, a sister of this Mahmoud. Balut Sultan married a sister of this Mahmoud Chalabi. Um, by doing so, he established a relationship with this family, which is important. And then they were both influential and made equally, <laughs> if not Mahmoud Chalabi, was more influential in the foundation of the Bektashi system order. So this person is really, really important in the Bekdashi history. And we have several references to this person in both archival sources and record sources. For example, Ashi Pashazada explicitly mentioned about his name and says he was the Khalifa of Haji Bekdash at the time and he had disciples. Uh, so he was a shaykh then. And also, he descended from Haji Bektash we have this information in Ashik Pashazata from the late 19th century. Again, Atma uh, Mubalaya explicitly mentions this person uh, uh, in the same in the <coughs> as the Hanukkah of Haji Bektash and he holds uh, dervishes, disciples, etc. And so, we know that Mahmoud Chiridi was the head of the family, Chiridi family, which was already established as the descendant of Haji Bektash Chiridi at the time, and then they were holding the back in terms of Haji Bektash Pekya and related that. So there is a whole history behind it. I cannot go into detail. Before this, sorry, sorry for interrupting you, dear Reza. Uh, we have some three or five minutes, so please, if we can uh, uh, conclude it. I felt this, yes. Okay, so uh, those who uh, are interested in details, I would just uh, suggest to go uh, read the book and uh, uh, rest 
a couple of minutes, I will just talk about this document that name document, which, which, which does not exist in the book, says, is again, it was dated in uh, 1988, and it's a kind of approval of his uh, position as the head of the family, as uh, the shape of Bagdashin, and as uh, the descendant of the Khamenei Sama Khamenei and in that document, his ancestors are listed up until Haji Bektaş Kedek himself. And then Haji Bektaş Kedek's uh, own spiritual genealogy. It's important to note that in this silsila uh, from Bahu Kedek to Haji Bektaş, they are uh, father to son. So that, that was also a biological genealogy. And then, the, uh, uh, before and upwards from Hadith Bektash Medik himself, it goes as Murshid, Murshid al -Kur. And the documents are this, by the way. So uh, it's just spiritual before Hadith Bektash Medik. So from Prophet Muhammad to Hadith Bektash Medik, there's a spiritual genealogy. And from Hadith Bektash to Muhammad Chalidi, and then after Muhammad Chalidi, the system comes as a both spiritual and biological genealogy of that. Let me just stop here if there will be any questions at the end which we can go more into detail and I, I don't want to take time of your love. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you very much, dear Reza. Uh, I am more, more than sure that uh, many people here listen for the first time. Certain relationship with administration. And this uh, caused the necessity of um, inventing for the social sciences the this silsila, and of course that the the, the, the issue that uh, Bektashism incorporates many heterodox elements, which for us, the researchers, I mean, is a great wealth. But for these elements, many people in the community have suffered a lot. Uh, anyway, I know. Thank you very much. Uh, we pass to the next presenter, and uh, at the end of the panel, we will have a discussion. If you might be asked for uh, the audience. Thank you very much again. So the floor is yours. My research uh, within the Ghost Project is a research project funded by European Research Council, which is taking place in Greece, in Crete, in a corpus of Turkish hagiographies, Menar Names, written between the 14th and 16th century. So, Menar Names um, are uh, originating from earlier oral traditions. Um, consist of anecdotal accounts highlighting the miraculous feats of their protagonists. Um, so these miraculous feats, they are referred to as terames. Um, they are, this term is different from the mujize, uh, which is reserved for only prophetic uh, miracles. And, Keramis can be understood as favors or gifts bestowed by God upon every young friends of God or saints of God. So my research involves a comparative analysis of Keramis. So my research involves a comparative analysis of Keramis and their various ideological as well as their reception in the society, as um, the reactions 
uh, of the people who witnessed those phenomena are also recorded in this text. Uh, my aim is to provide a fresh perspective into the changing reliant concept in this for transformative period um, and uh, also to understand the role of reliance in shaping communal identities. So, of course, the study of Velayet concept and, uh, in extension, the whole Menak Tramejan uh, offers many challenges, uh, not only due to the nature of the genre, but because the period following the Mongol invasions of the 13th century is marked by the disruptions of uh, many of political and religious institutions across many lands in the Islamic lands. And this led to the emergence of uh, new forms of religiosity that developed its own institutions and networks of Islamic mysticism, which all have to be understood on their own terms. In Anatolia, uh, crudity or untidiness, characterized as the main features of Sufism by some scholars, prevailed over the course of the next 300 years or so until the establishment of the regional empires of the Ottomans, Safavids, Uzbeks, and Magals, and under which some of the Sufi parts become institutionalized under strict governmental scrutiny and were integrated into the organized title. That was Rizayo who was talking about today. And during this turbulent period, the political upheaval and chaotic cultural setting in Anatolia and the Balkans made room for proliferation of the saintly figures who could combine their military and missionary activities in their charisma. And this gave rise to a different kind of religious expression that also found an outlet in Sufism. This anarchic period, uh, as some scholars refer to it, also fostered uh, messianic expectations where Muslim holy men and also rulers competed to become divine saviors, addressing the needs and concerns of local populations facing daily perils and uncertainties all the time. So from a broader perspective, uh, Keramet served as a means to alleviate the challenges faced in this period of uh, significant instability. Many of these keramets were centered around attempting to exert control over nature and an unpredictable future. The Evliya were perceived as direct intermediaries to God, capable of providing solutions to mundane problems, such as, for instance, healing illnesses, multiplying food, providing water resources, and so on. Another important function of these miracles was related to the ongoing Islamization process which was achieved or given impetus as some of the miracles deeds attributed to Muslim holy men gradually replaced those around the Vita of the local Christian saints. Many sacred sites previously associated with Christian saints were transformed into Muslim sanctuaries as some studies have shown. So to give some specific examples, Haji Bektaş became identified with St. Haralambos in Surja Karenbuk, Sarasaltu with St. Nicholas in Dobruja, and Baba Ilyas with St. Theodore and St. George in Evkata, today near modern day Chorin. So some of the keramics recorded in the hagiography, such as walking on water or resurrecting the dead, coming from a biblical origin, were effective tools for converting Christians and should be approached as part of the religious polemics of the time, debating the superiority of one religion over another. As Tiana Kristic notes, replicating the miracles attributed to Jesus is in fact, I quote, an argument against Jesus' uniqueness and the Christians claim that he is the son of God and God himself. Paradoxically, this raises also the question whether replicating the same kind of miracles could be seen as an implicit acknowledgement of Christian assertions regarding Jesus' divine essence and his capacity to raise the dead. So, that's the question. Today, I will focus on specific uh, examples of miracles involving animals or the control of nature in general, uh, which are used as evidence 
Evliya, Evliya Saint Nestatus and to establish continuity between them. So these miracles can be classified into three categories. The saints, for example, its purpose, as noted by Shai Peya, historian, is the demonstration of the existence of the Creator through the observation of creation and the glorification of divine wisdom, which has centered nothing, which has created nothing that is truly useless or harmful. Animals are there to convey meaning, and the miracles involving them primarily serve as allegorical representations of the unique closeness between the saint and the animal. For example, uh, Barak Baba, a disciple of Sarasavta, who gave him the honorific uh, title Barak, which means hairless dog, is said to have controlled a tiger, or according to some account, a lion, uh, with a single cry when he, is, he appeared before Ghazanaman in Tabriz. In Damascus, he was asked to confront a wild ostrich, uh, which he is reported to have tamed instantly. Another example, a well-known anecdote from the Velayi family of Hacı Bektaş, the big saint Mahmud Hayran, attempting to surpass Hacı Bektaş by riding a lion and using a snake as a whip. However, he is humbled by Hacı Bektaş, who mounts a wall to ride out and greet him. And when Mahmud Hayran witnesses Hacı Bektaş commanding even an inanimate yet strong and timeless rock, uh, Mahmoud Hayran acknowledges his arrogance or human vanglory in general by stating, "En nazarına müstahane gelmişiz." So, a few words maybe on the symbolism behind this action. Uh, the lion and the venomous serpent are associated with the lion, venomous, and uh, mastering them is reminiscent of uh, magic. Of course, not Islamic magic, because there is also good magic. <laughs> in contrast. Uh, the wall suggests a uh, settled life and civilization, as also noted previously by Martin van Brunsen. Uh, and uh, I am not going into this meaning of all domesticating the animal, taming the soul um, in Islamic mysticism, but uh, suffice it to say, the earliest Sufi to, to have mounted a lion and used a serpent as a whip is uh, Bayezid al Bistami, who was regarded as I call the archetype of the intoxicated non-conformist mystic, in contrast to the settled, sober, more sherry oriented varieties. So therefore, Haji Bektash with his command of settled dervishes has been interpreted as the representative of the mystics and holy men who have accepted integration with mainstream Muslim society based on this anecdote. And while Mahmud Hayra, uh, accompanied by lions and snakes, symbolizes the mystics who reject such accommodation. Um, so the motive of contest and competition between religions is a common topos in legends of conversion as the Indians have shown, has shown. And miracles has that demonstrated control over forces of nature played a crucial role in convincing Christians to embrace Islam as these miracles were seen as compelling evidence of the saints' proximity to God. The hagiographies I am studying constantly raise questions and doubts regarding the true nature of the protagonist's saintly character. He is often mistaken for being a jadu, a sorcerer, a sahir, sometimes, as similar attempts to exert control over nature can be considered as a form of magic. In fact, several examples from the South of Nameh um, describe various jadu figures associated with black magic, uh, as they are uh, mounting wild uh, beasts such as winged lions and rhinosaurs and all sorts of uh, weird creatures. Anyway, so by using snakes as they whip, these jadus are capable of bestriding animals, which are always at their disposal. So this raises again another question: uh, What distinguishes a jadu, sahir, or a veli? What man confronted with the same question, voiced by the Christians and sources? Sarasal took desperately tries to explain that what he does is not magic, but velayet, the miracle of our prophet, he says, bizim peygamberimizin mucizesidir. It is important to note that the emphasis is placed on the prophet of Islam and his intermediary force, which enables Sarasal to perform miracles. 
Um, however, another possible interpretation arises when considering the Saltuk Nami within the 16th century context, because this is the earliest copy of the text that we have in hand, and it contains some anachronistic references. And uh, if we read this anecdote on this layer, on the 16th century layer, it is possible uh, that some keramics, once seen as evidence of proximity to God, began to be viewed differently in the 16th century. During this period, the concept of competition between saints seemed to have entirely disappeared, making way, as noted by Gottfried Hagen, for a, I quote, this is words, more scripture-oriented idea of Satan, diverging from the association of so-called wilderness, aka non-conformist Islam. So besides the theme of contest and competition between saints, uh, perhaps as a result of it, various narrative devices also were employed uh, in the sources to establish continuity among Muslim holy men. These include typically uh, shrine visits, uh, miracles encounters through visions and dreams, um, and replicating the miracles attributed to a saint is another effective tool uh, of creating continuity. Uh, I would like to focus uh, to finish uh, my talk very briefly <laughs> uh, on one such example uh, which, through which connections were uh, established in various directions, I must say, uh, which I will not have time to discuss extensively, but it's about the association of the dragon slaying legend to Sarisato. So, and this is how <laughs> Sir Saldan, like Sayyid Bakta, yeah. uh, became woven into the Bektashi oral traditions and served as a point of reference in a number of hagiographies in the account of his fight with Bergon. Uh, previous studies have highlighted associations between Haji Bektash and notably the episode in the Vilayat town, where Haji Bektash visits the shrine of Sayyid Bakta, is followed by his encounter with Sir Saldan. And both Saltuk Name and the Vilayat Name uh, claim that Sir Saltuk was a disciple of Taji Bektash. These episodes were analyzed by Rizai Oderim previously, so I'm not going into that. What I want to say, um, the story of Sir Saltuk's killing the dragon through the intermediary of Taji Bektash, sending Hazar to Sir Saltuk's aid in the Vilayat Name, is repeated in the Vilayat Name, in many Vilayat Name also, including the Vilayat Name of, of Bambaba. Um, but while this, in the south of Dhamma, the story is entirely different, and there is no mention of Haji Bektaj or any other intermediate force. Maybe referring to an earlier layer in this narrative, I'd say. So I would like to turn to a different direction for a minute, um, and hopefully connect everything together, thanks to Sari Saltu, you have me. Um, the Byzantine epic, uh, Dhamma epic, the Yenis Akritis, and the Turkish warrior epics such as the Battaname and the Danish Battaname, and the Satuman would be the third cycle of this warrior epic genre in Anatolia and Bab. Anyway, so all these <laughs> epics are highly informed by the frontier experiences uh, which have developed around the region of Malatya and spread through maybe through the, with the advance of the Turks and the circulation of the stories. Um, Further, they spread through Amasya with the Dalish Matname and then to the Balkans of the South, or at least this text, you know, trace those developments on these sites. And these texts maintain thematic, narratological, and geographical continuity. I'm not going to discuss about it. Uh, and uh, all share the motive of dragon slaying. So, dragon slaying legends uh, must have been associated with St. George, as you might know and some scholars have traced the origins of this legend to an earlier period uh, and have and identified the saint with Saint Theodore, the patron saint of Elkata, Choro, which I mentioned before, in the Amasya region. And from there, from where the dragon legend might have started to circulate. Many sacred sites associated with these saints uh, were taken over by mystic figures, as I mentioned before, and uh, they included that also into the cult of Huzer, uh, which was venerated by Christians too. So Huzer is often associated with St. George and sometimes with St. Theodore, as they ride the same horse and they have the dragon legend in common. St. Theodore of Elkata, uh, Elkhaita, that's a Buddhist 
describe as khata. As khata. He's one of the so-called military saints, uh, famous among soldiers for performing miracles during the Arab Byzantine confrontations. Saint Theodore, Saint George, and Saint Nicholas, they are all uh, believed to answer the prayers of those whose relatives were taken captive by the Arabs and they, uh, they, they are prayed to ensure their safe return. So the earliest document about the dragon slaying, Saint Theodore, depicts him as a soldier. He is believed to have smashed the Arab siege against the city by appearing in front of the gates, just like Mevlana Jalaluddin Rum, who is believed to have prevented the Mongol invasion in Konya in the same manner. So, according to Ayapoya Point Panjarolo, uh, the miracle of the Rakhon slaying became an accessory to the narrative intersection of otherwise unconnected heroic and holy figures. In this regard, the identification of Muslim holy figures with local legends and Christian saints can be seen as a conscious effort, which facilitated not only the transition into Islam, but also the way the new settlers adapted themselves to the country they have recently come to inhabit. Such efforts were also maintained through the transference of certain motives and figures in various examples of Turkish heroic religious literature, creating historical as well as geographical continuity and thereby legitimizing the same status for Muslim women. To conclude, uh, the emergence of new group identities in medieval Anatolia, whether centered around a charismatic figure like a Ghazi warrior or a Veli celebrated for a miraculous deeds, is frequently facilitated through the narratives woven around the cult of this figure. This phenomenon resonates with the Bruce Lincoln's instrumental perspective on me as a constitutive force in society. And in the case of Menach Brahmins, believing in the Karamans attributed to a saint generates collective sentiments that are pivotal in forging social cohesion within a group. The saint's ability to perform miracles not only serves as an indicator of divine selection, but also validates his followers' assertion of their social group's significance. Therefore, Menachem Namens are not mere collection of motives. They are invaluable sources that shed light on how these groups engage with their surroundings and establish their communal identities through interactions with others. While it's evident that patronizing efforts of the Balkan warlords in Anatolia can be viewed as a political statement, uh, as uh, some previous studies by Zeynep Riyadi and Hid Lori show, uh, so connecting these uh, Anatolian, the, the, the, their efforts uh, uh, focused on connecting this, uh, uh, connecting the Anatolian Ghazi tradition with their activities in Romania. So I believe in that context, so it's how to play the central role in, as the link between these regions and the dragon legend in this context serves as a narrative conduit enabling the assimilation of local traditions and beliefs by two commanding communities through a multi-layered synthesizing process. Sarisautu emerges as a pivotal figure, intimately connecting local Christian beliefs, Ghazi legends, and the Velayat Ramija within the context of both Anatolia and the Balkans. Thank you very much for your attention. by listening to miracles, uh, to Mujizé and uh, Keramet and all this, and having some kind of knowledge regarding the um, Greek, Greek Orthodox tradition regarding miracles, I see all this uh, What I keep is the transformation. If we um, see this under uh, modern, not modern, contemporary approaches, if energy, the relation between energy and mat uh, material, so we have transformation when we are. And uh, yeah, the unity of the existence of al Baghdad al Wujud, it's material and energy at the same time. Thank you very much. And now the floor is to dear Mr. Keith Lowry. Let me. Uh, uh, and at the end, we will have a discussion if there are questions. So let me please see how, how we connect this. I think. Yeah.
Dear Mr. Hitlori, the floor is yours. this topic, I had every intention of being with you. That was during the COVID outbreak. I managed to escape COVID for two years. And now, the very week that I was coming to Kavala for this meeting, I managed to get a case of COVID. So while I'm unable to be with you in physical being, I'm certainly there with you in spirit. Tonight I want to talk about a subject that is directly related to uh, the topics that have been discussed earlier this evening, and that is a question which is understudied by everything to do with the Vedashis, and that relates to some of the monuments that they have left. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about one monument that is in northern Greece, it's uh, south of uh, Iskeche, Zanti. Uh, it's a monument which is misnamed, misdated, and generally misunderstood. It is known in the literature as the Tuktu Baba service. Uh, the location is about 10 kilometers uh, west of Yanitsa, Yeni Jakarasu, and uh, lying between Yenis and Kabbalah. It is the site of a magnificent, this was a picture I took in 2005, a magnificent uh, turbe. If this turbe was in Istanbul or Bursa, it could easily be mistaken for the turbe of one of the early Ottoman sultans. When I first went there in 2005, it was in the middle of a field. In the summertime, it was hard to even see it. Uh, it was in a semi-state of ruin. Then it was beautifully restored by the uh, Ipore in Kabbalah, uh, particularly by Argelis Patirtsis, and its restoration shows it an even more spectacular monument. Pardon. It is made of uh, cut blocks of limestone. In the words of Art Guinness, it is a composite structure of great elegance, which consists of an octagonal building, uh, so many meters in circumference, that shelters the tomb of the Baba, and a square four by four meter vestibule attached to the east side of the octagon. The outside of the walls are constructed of brownish yellow limestone from the area of Mahandra, cut into finely hewn rectangular blocks. The area of Mahandra is about 10 kilometers south of uh, the site. It is indeed a spectacular tomb. Our problems begin with the fact that in the entire pantheon of Bektashi, Sheikhs, peers, Babas, Sultans, there is nobody named Tutu Baba. Uh, when I first decided to begin looking into this uh, subject, I began looking at Ottoman archival documents. And I found that while there's nobody named Tutu Baba, we do have some documents that give us a hint about what this name really means. Uh, in a 1557, 1558 uh, tax register for the Casa of Bora, the district of Bora of Boru, in Gulagini at that time, Sketchy was not even a small village, everything was part of Gulagini, Palmatini. There is a village named Kari Kutuklu, the village of Kutuklu. And a late 18th century document uh, dealing with the appointment of a Sabiadar, the uh, keeper of the uh, tomb 
or they could do to Haji Baba Sabiya in Yulajini. Yulajini, they could do to Haji Baba Sabiya Sardin in Temji. This gives us our first clue that in fact the name Tuklu is not the name of the person residing in the tomb, but rather a toponym. Yeah. 1852 document appoints a sheikh to the Tuklu Haji Gedi Sabiya in Yulajini, and that is where it ends with the archival documents. Why is it known as the Kututukta Baba Turkesis, or Tekke? The first author to call it that was Hector Mapi Iberdi in his 1982 work. He published two photographs of what he called the Kututukta Baba Sabia and survey in the human city village of Boro. But he also pointed out that he had not seen it himself these were photographs that an unidentified individual had sent to him. A second reference to it appeared in 1984 in a work, a small work by a man named uh, a Western uh, Croatian Turk named Abdul Rahman Dede. And the first serious work to describe it was in the pioneering work of Estratino Sekinis, 1988, on the Bektashis in Greece. A local school teacher in Gulagini, in a work, a very important work actually, in 2003, Ismail Chakti also called it the Tukta Baba Tukta again after uh, Iver. The first real eyewitness to publish it was Torres Lagromatis, who visited it twice, I recall in 1999 and again in 2005. And he gave us not only a detailed description of it, but some very important photographs. Again, in 2005, it appears in a work which is seldom used, but should be quite more often used. A work edited by George Cigarras, which was actually published by the Metropolitan of uh, Zanti and the uh, Moltu of Zanti on religious monuments in Zante, Steche, and a work that includes 16 Bektashi sites in uh, that area. I published it in 2008 with a number of photographs. In the same year, Argenis Makirsis, uh, its restorer, published it. When Mavromatis visited in 1999, it clearly was a site revered by both local Muslims and Bektashis and local Christians. Uh, the uh, Sanda of the saint on the left, the Christian site on the right, you can see uh, on the left of that picture the uh, icon of St. George, other icons, and a candelabra. When I visited in 2005 for the first time, the Muslim site had the Quran laying on top of the uh, saint's tomb. The Christian site still had its candelabra, but no longer were there any uh, icons. While it was restored, being restored, this photo was taken in 2008. You see the backdrop of the road of mountains behind it. You also see, particularly in the photo on the right here, the really extreme care with which uh, it had been constructed. The detail of the masonry work shows that this was certainly a major monument at the time it was built. We're still left with the question of when was it built and who was this individual misnamed who took the Baba? One of the strange things about it is that the site where it was built is within a kilometer and a half of the remains of the Roman ancient city of Peripiorian or Emporium, Turkish Bori or Boru or Boru, uh, which had plenty of, plenty of stone which could have been used in its building, but rather its builder chose to import stone from a distance of 10 kilometers away. The clue to what it really is and was is found in a 
tax register, an Ottoman tax register, of uh, Hitri 965, 1557, 58. There, we see a, a, an extremely important note which says, Ismet Karani Dervishani Zadi Ajibabaski Yaka Pasha Odu Bali Bebina Elede. The servants of the dervishes of the Haji Baba Zafiya Teke, which was built by Yahya Pashaoldu Balibe. The name Yahya Pashaoldu Balibe is a name well known. He was a major march lord on the Hungarian frontier, a long ways, a long ways from our site. And he built this tomb and lodge in the village of Hiravid or Kutuklu. And we know that it built it prior to 1527, which happens to be the year of his death. <coughs> so from this, we know that the actual name of the site was not the Tutukulava Zabiyasi, but Ajibaba Zabiyasi. We know that its builder was Yayapashul Bali Bay, and that it was built prior to his death in 1527. <coughs> we have a series of uh, documents related, uh, Bakhtia, uh, Bakhtia documents relating to this subject, which tell us that it was built, that uh, the properties that were alienated, earmarked on its behalf, were used to be used for the Ayendi, Ravendi, those who come and go, that is, travelers. They included various revenue sources from the nearby villages of Kerevizke, a ship of 25 six acre farm, windmills in the Lumagini village of Akhtanar, uh, and a note that these had been endowed to this idea by Mehmet Bey, the son of Yahya Pasha, that is, a younger brother of Yahya Pasha, Malik Bey, the builder of our Haji Baba Zabiyya. It specifically states that the aforementioned Zabiyya is in the village of Erebidi, which is attached to Yenichi Karasu, Deraviz is the present day Turkish name for the village of Sinio, which is indeed the site of our turbid. An undated 18th century work, the Vesaiki Betkashian, documents on the Betkashis, provides the following on the history of our site. It says that the Kutuklu Haji Baba Zabiyya, which is located in the land of Rumedi, in the district of Gulijini. The Vesaik and Bekashian depicts a troubled history for the Haji Baba Zabiyya, one in which control shifted back and forth between the heterodox Bekashi and the orthodox Kubrivi and their resources. Having begun, as the name Haji Baba implies, as a Bekashi technique in the late 15th or early 16th century, in the 17th century it came under the control of the Kubrivi. Then again, in the mid 18th century, the Bektashis regained possession, only to have it fall into the hands of an unscrupulous and unqualified sheikh, who managed to turn the properties of the foundation into his own private property, which is me. The result was a foundation with no real source of income. In other words, it effectively ceased to exist as a functioning dervish large. The English traveler Daniel, uh, Edward Daniel Clark, uh, who visited the area uh, in the beginning of the 19th century, is the only traveler account I have found that actually describes the site. He says, about an hour's distance from the town that is in Chikaras and Yanitsa, we came to the dwelling of a Turkish saint. He lives in a little stone building near the road, which had more the appearance of a small ancient temple than of a modern structure. Opposite the door was a red flag and blow it in a box to receive paras, small coins, as pipe explanations for passengers. These saints in Turkey are either persons bereft of reason or who affect to be so, and they are very much revered. This is uh, the entrance as it looks today after what I said was the beautiful restoration. And this is the interior, which once again has regained its joint usage. 
that is, it is a site both revered by local Muslims, particularly Bekdashi Muslims, and by local Christians. Each of them have their own legends concerning the building. Who was Adirwal? This, of course, is the most interesting question we have here. Uh, it is one which I will admit at the outset I do not have a, an accurate answer for. What I can tell you is that there were numerous Pektashi Tekes throughout Ottoman lands named after Haji Baba. Uh, in Rumeli, we have our present site. In Kabbalah, uh, in the village of Lefteri, in Lefteris, there was a Haji Baba Teke. In Nigeria, there was a Haji Baba Zabiya. In southeastern Anatolia, in Antep, there was a Haji Baba Zabiya. In Palestine, in the village of Hajikur, there was a Haji Baba Zabiya. In Anatolia, in Sarohan, in Kutahia, in Diz, Gerdez, in Nan, Oma, uh, in Rumeli, in Shodra, and so forth. A total of 16 Bektashi sites that uh, turbids Tete's, Zabdias, that were named after a Hajibaba. Were they all the same Hajibaba? That I cannot answer. What I can propose is a very tentative hypothesis, one which I'll be interested in seeing how Rizal Yildirim reacts to. And that is my feeling that it might possibly be a tomb of the real founder of the Kashi order, the Piri Isaniya, the second elder, Balin Sultan. Balin Sultan, we have accounts that he was born in the nearby Romantian town of Didimotikim, in 1457, to a Christian mother. He was raised in and later served as a sheikh of the nearby Fasid Ali Sultan Tekke, that is also known as Tuzo Sultan Tekke. He died in 1519. Shortly before the Haji Baba Zafi, it was built by Yanni Fashiolu Bali Bay in the 1520s. We also know that the inscription on his presumed tomb in the Anatolian village of Haji Bektash, ending in Luzer Bali, is apocryphal and, and uh, tries to make the claim that he was a descendant of Haji Bektash himself. Leaving that aside, is it simply coincidence that a Hungarian march lord? This is a figure like Evernos or Mihail, uh, one of the great Ottoman conquerors of the Balkans, that he would have built a tomb as grand as this in an area of park. We never, never served there. He never fought there. We have nothing linking him to this area of uh, uh, Western Thrace or Eastern Macedonia, except for this tomb. The second possibility, although I think it's less so, comes from the work of the pioneering work of Astuk, who records that when he visited the Tekke of Sarasaltuk in Kildre in Bulgaria, he describes it as uh, that fact that the former re the residents of it no longer record recorded as Sarasaltuk's tomb. They now hold, or at least the Christians, that it was the tomb of St. Nicholas. <laughs> And for the Turks, the saint worship there now is known as Ajibam. Well, tenuous, this passage points to a possibility that one of the names which Sadra Sultan Sultan was known by may have been Ajibam. The answer to this final question I will certainly leave to those younger and, uh, well, younger is enough, younger than me to uh, attempt to, since I have given you the Builder, the approximate date of construction, and the name of the individual who was, whose honor it was built in, I believe the, the final question as to who he may have been to you. Thank you very much. Uh, we thank you very much, dear uh, Mr. Flory. For me, it's very interesting to, to listen to this presentation. Here is also Mr. Arginis Bagirzis, 
uh, attending the, the presentation. And uh, also... Please, you know, sorry? please. I get it, an old friend, so please give him my greetings. So yeah, he's, he's listening there. And also, Georgos Mavromatis, who took these photographs uh, <laughs> some years ago. So let me ask you, start the, the circle of the questions, or let me share with you a, a thought of mine. The Teke, known as the Teke of the Teke, the Turbet, Baba, sits in the middle of nowhere. I mean, a Turbet without a Teke is rather rare. Yes, except for this fact. Yeah. The local Greeks of Sedino, those yes. Poles who took to Baba uh, City, they call it to took to Baba Teke City. Yes, I know. It was, a, it was a Teke. And in 1826, when the Bektashi Tekes were destroyed, uh, what was left was the turbine. Okay. And, and this was true in numerous other places as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know. The point is that in uh, that turbine, we don't see, I didn't see, any kind of symbol which might indicate that it belongs to the Bektashi Tarikat. Neither it is Kimtashi, nor a Teber nor whatever you can imagine could be, could be a Bektashi symbol. So I'm quite skeptical regarding if this actually is a Bektashi Teke. And uh, Zenginis also says that we have, uh, he names him a Bektashi Teke. But uh, what I saw there is a um, performance of folk Balkanic Islam. Most probably by people uh, so named uh, gypsies. Uh, I'm not sure. Look, look, we have no architectural monuments no, yeah. of this nature in stone built by the Roma. Yeah. Uh, Let uh, alone in Western Thrace. Yeah. What we do have is a march lord, a major, major early 16th century Ottoman conqueror in Hungary who builds a Bekashi Teke for Gulbakla yes, in Hungary and another here mm. for this Haji Baba. Yes. So the, the, the idea that, that uh, oh, it's quite is, is, is that Bektashi seems to me is possible. I, I, you know, I've had doubts about this for a long time. I mean, when I first saw it, I was fascinated by it, but I was certainly troubled by the fact that there is no, no figure named Tutu the Baba that appears in any Bektashi literature, any Bektashi literature. Also, there is a, in the area of Evros a small uh, uh, a place called uh, Kutuplu, and there is also a Kutuplu Baba place here, but no historical yeah. evidence there. Anyway, yeah. what I would like to say and stop here is that I didn't see any Bektashi symbols, and I saw outside the uh, remains of the Kurban. It was the half burned uh, stones and the rock from the tree which where the, the animal was skinned. So, I think it's that, a time. Excuse me, excuse me, that's a Nadakye. And that is, Nadakye uh, is the place that sacrifices are made by Bektashis. Yes. Uh, you have a similar one in Trianopolis, in uh, uh, near Fedez, where the Teke there, which is now a, a chapel to uh, uh, St. Demetrius, on top of the hill there, has a Nadakye, which is still used just as the turban is by, by Muslims and Christians. Yes, okay. Uh, that's, that was my comment. Okay, I'm very happy to listen to all these things. I don't know if uh, Mr. Bagirjis wants to say something. Would you like to come? Yes, okay. Now I must say at the outset that my entire friendship with Argiris is also based with Anna and Now you see always been our translator, so Yes,
είναι αλήθεια αυτό το κτίριο είναι καταπληκτικό. Ε, ε, είναι τόσο ωραίο και το δουλέψαμε με ένα πολύ καλό μηχανικό, τον κύριο Καμίλιο. Εγώ είμαι αρχιτέκτο. Πηγαίνουμε στη Νέα και είχαμε πολύ καλό εργολάβο από την Τζάφη. Ε, και έγινε πάρα πολύ καλή δουλειά. Αξίζει να Δεν έχω να πω τίποτα γι' αυτό αν ήταν δεκτασίδητο ή όχι. Αλλά θα σα πω κάτι που μου είχε κάνει πολύ εντύπωση. Πριν από όλα, ο τάφο ήταν τεράστιο. Αλλά ήταν και μετάφυλλο. Δεν υπήρχε μέσα, δεν υπήρχε αυτό καλά. Και το γνώρισε ήταν φίλοι και τα είχαν πάρει μαζί του, δεν ξέρω. σω από την αρχή ήταν και μετάφυλλο. Και είχε ενδιαφέρον, είχε χειμώνα και καθαρίζαμε το γάπατο, το τάφο δίπλα. Και ξαφνικά μου έκανε πολύ κρύο, από τι άκρε του τάφου μπροστά μου είχαν δύο φίδια. Και σύγχρονα από την κεφάλι. Και ήταν σοβαρό, μα έκανε τρομερή εντύπωση. Ναι, ναι, ο Κιάνας είναι στον άνθρωπο, τι μένεις εγώ. Αν ήσουν εκεί μαζί. Όχι, θα τους ανασυνάντησα ως δικοί μου πίσω. Α, όχι, μέσα στον άνθρωπο. Είχα κάνει πάρα πολύ εντυπωσιακό. Αυτό, τώρα, την απόλυτη αναστήλωση. Για το μεγάλο πρόβλημα που είχαμε ήταν ότι το γάμματο του Κουρβέ ήταν πολύ πιο και αρκετά πιο χαμηλά από το φυσικό έντοπος. Οπότε είχαν μαζέρα τα νερά και κάλυπτα για ένα μέτρο αλλά κάναμε πολύ ωραία, έτσι απομακρύναμε τα νερά, ελπίζω να έχουμε το τέλος. Uh, do you understand what he says in Greek, in Greek words and translation? <laughs> well, uh, he has explained the situation between you and him when you were talking about the Turbe. He also explained the story where he found the Turbe many, many years ago. He talked about the restoration and the fact that he found two uh, snakes. Το snakes when he he doesn't he says that he does not know if I'm translating correctly what he said right but maybe I do not I do I do and so you can continue and translate for him he just want to thank us thank you very much if I wish you were here I wish you were here I'll see you soon. Bye bye. Bye. So here we are again. Uh, please, uh, if you have any questions, any part of this exhibition, you have to come and ask us. I didn't say it was a hazard. Yes, it's okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I cannot. Uh, I would not say uh, this question cannot be uh, voluntary, but also I would be cautious. Uh, because we have so little about Marusukta and most of the information we also have uh, in some of them about Marusukta is coming to Babadan sources which have been written in the 19th century. Yeah. So those are uh, uh, mentalists, presence about uh, his family, his mother. These are stories told by Babadan people. Uh, we, we see them similar stories in Ahmed Rifat of Hermes, book, and then they uh, her those stories from um, uh, Ahmed uh, Albanian, Bekash, Riyazi, Begabala, and others. So we have this tradition there on that branch. But in the meantime, as you have noticed, in his description, it says son of Rasul Cherebi, son of Adi Bekash. That's an important source. And those, uh, that, that the Rama that uh, I, that I drew in the book says Dalman of Hadi Bekash, or Hazib, and his name is Hazib Bali in the official documents, by the way. That's the If they're the same person. Yeah, well, these are all open questions to me. Yeah, me too. That's why I 
No, I threw it out there. I don't, I don't know. I, I'm struck by the fact that there is a, you know, time-wise, a link between the date that the Badi Sultan is supposed to die, 1619, and the building of this survey in the early 1520s, and the fact that it was built by a major march lord from Hungary, meaning that it must have been built for somebody that was very, very important to him. Uh, so that, you know, that's why I left that question open. I, I, I don't know, but uh, you're the guy who's going to answer this. I just, I, I'm just raising the question for you. Thank you, Excellency. Uh, I also can do I mean, what we can do at this point of uh, research, just raising right questions over useful questions. Because for the answers, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of questions. Well, well this, is, this, was, this, yeah, this was the most important thing I thought of your talk. The fact that you highlight the fact about not what we know, but what we don't know and what we don't have sources for. You know, there are lots of legends, but uh, what we as historians have to do is to try and, you know, dig as much as possible. We need those legends. I mean, in the case of this Kutukta Baba Tsuri, it has been dated to the 17th century, 18th century, uh, you know, uh, and it's only one two-line passage in a 16th century tabir up there that pinpoints when it had to have been built and who built it. Yeah, yeah. I had, um, earlier, I had earlier written that I thought it was going to be late 14th century by Amber Rose. I was wrong. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, sorry, did I interrupt you? No, no. Okay. Uh, are there any questions? Just a question. Yes, please. It's more like a remark. Uh, I don't know when you visited in Xanthi, um, but we have two places that uh, come here and they will see you and you can see okay. <laughs> And address them to all this. Uh, hi. Uh, I don't know when you visited Xanthi, but uh, we have two places actually where uh, spiritualities intervene uh, with each other, meaning Christian and Muslim spiritualities. One, of course, is the fake Tetya uh, Kituklu Baba. I only learned about the fakeness of the name today, and uh, for many of us knowing Xanthi, it would be quite some news to, to change the uh, understanding of the space and how we present it. But this is not the, the, the grave of Kituklu uh, uh, Baba. But there is also another monument in the mountains, uh, the grave of St. George. We suppose that the name of the person that is buried there, or was buried there, is St. George. Uh, some of the uh, folk stories uh, mention that uh, he was probably a Pomak that uh, refused to uh, embrace Islam. And this only came uh, as a as, as, as a knowledge uh, when uh, uh, refugees came from the minor Asia in the region. And Muslims again venerated that space. Uh, they thought that there was a genie or a ghost uh, living there. A Christian person went, received some materials, then the uh, elderly figure appeared to his dream. And now we venerate Christians and Muslims again, uh, the person in the mountain. And again, the name is not real. We just found a cross with a name George. So we, meant, uh, we named the, the dead person there that both Christians and uh, Muslims venerate as George. And uh, for me, it's quite interesting to see that in, in a small place like in Xanthi, we have now at least two cases where uh, we venerate Christians and Muslims, Orthodox and heterothodox uh, uh, religious pe uh, people, two bodies, uh, two dead people, whom we don't know anything about them, actually. And uh, it's quite interesting that we still continue doing that. Christians still go to take take to the club about every summer because until two years ago there was a, a folk music festival taking place there of uh, Eastern music. Not anymore, unfortunately. Uh, and Christians light candles. Or even the bishop uh, of the Metropolitan of Xanthi and Periferia visited the grave uh, two years ago or three years ago. 
And again, Muslims are going to the Christian chapel now in the mountain, where the grave of the unknown saint is located, and they offer their prayers uh, there as well. So, we need your knowledge, we need your wisdom, because we speak about these places, but probably we speak in a wrong way, and we describe them in a wrong way. Thank you. One of, the, one of the things I think we need much more attention to is something I've been working on for some time now, and I have a book coming out hopefully next year, is the role of the Bektashis as missionaries in the Balkans. They played a very important role in converting local, particularly poor Christians, to their version of Islam. And they did so in the shadow of the institution known as the Zabiyeb, or where you are, Imaret. Because the Balkan Imarets, unlike the Balkan soup kitchens in Anatolia or the Arab world, were open to everyone. Evliya Chelebi describes 30, over 30 of these soup kitchens and says how they were open to Muslims, non-Muslims, Jews, fire worshippers, gypsies, uh, and that's true, they were. And they served as a means of bringing lower levels of society in contact with one another. Bektashis didn't preach any kind of Orthodox Islam. They preached a very heterodox Islam. If you were a Christian and you said, yes, but we drink wine, and we don't fast, and we don't pray five times a day, the Bektashis said, well, we don't either. So the Bektashis were, I think, an agent for religious conversion. Uh, and this is a subject that needs a lot more study, but I think it helps explain this phenomenon you're talking about. The fact that so many of these sites could be worshipped jointly by Muslims and Christians. Uh, they saw them as, you know, they don't see that as a problem. And we're not talking about the 15th century, we're talking about the 21st century. The fact that here in Haji Baba Zari, in Baba, or in the site you mentioned in Zanti, or in the Nefes Sultan Baba Tenkisi Turbisi in Trianopolis, uh, uh, uh, Lutras, uh, there are, these are still sites visited by both local Christians and local Muslims, as, by the way, is the site that you will be visiting, unfortunately I won't be, uh, two days from now in Kuzul Delhi Sultan, or Sayyid Ali Sultan. Uh, many of the people who visit there are, are uh, Christians, and this has been so for a long time. Uh, you know, when, when we, and I could give you numerous similar examples in Anatolia, and I don't know much about other Balkan countries, but I'm sure that I could do the same if I knew it in Bulgaria or Albania uh, just as well. Uh, at the local level, uh, much more united people than divided them. And while, you know, nationalism has changed that, uh, I think, uh, certainly in the period I studied, the 15th and 16th centuries, uh, Things were a lot more, uh, a lot more uh, interrelated than we see them today. Okay. Okay. Thank but you very much. Sorry, sorry for interrupting. No, no, no, that's, no, that's fine. That's uh, fine. There is also another question. Yes, please. Yes. Uh... Thank you. I have a question for Zainab. Uh, Zainab, you mentioned the the ability of the Menachem Name to make communities. And you also mentioned the role of these military stories. I was curious what you think the Menachem Name says about the Bektashi as a community in terms of related to military symbolism, actions, and so forth. Thanks. I'm sorry if I understand correctly. This Menachem Name can be viewed as. I didn't understand that. No, just one of your points was that you said that they, they help make community identity, they help bring people together. So I'm curious about the role of, of these stories at, for the Bektashi as a military identity. Uh, and we know, of course, the axes are always present in the, in the tech case and so forth. 
So I'm curious how you would kind of see the relationship between these texts and this military aspect that is sometimes lost when we talk about Bektash. Yes, that's an excellent question. I don't know how to respond to it. <laughs> okay. I have to think about it, but I think all these men, some of them, they also future these you know, warrior dervishes, and some men are not so distinct from this warrior epic genre as in the case of the South Planet. And I'm sure if you look into it more, uh, they must have a you know, shaping role in this military. <coughs> yeah. But I, I don't know. <laughs> thank you. Okay. We thank you all very much. And uh, we hope to see you tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah.